Christian Jopke, a professor of politics at the American University of Paris. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California at Berkeley, previously taught at the University of Southern California, the European University Institute, the University of British Columbia, and International University Bremen. His recent books include Citizenship and Immigration, Veil, Mirror of Identity, and Selecting by Origin, Ethnic Migration in the Liberal State. His current research interest is the accommodation of Islam in Europe and North America. Please welcome him. Yeah. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm, of course, the odd person uh, from the outside, so I have the buffoon's uh, privilege to say funny things. I will say three things. Uh, one, uh, um, questioning the premise uh, of uh, the notion of something that is broken, namely that something that is, once was coherent, uh, I don't think uh, there can be an, a coherent immigration policy uh, anywhere. Uh, secondly, a few words about the European system. And thirdly, what America can learn from that positively and uh, negatively. Um, point number one, uh, indeed, fixing a broken system <clears throat> presupposes uh, a system that was once intact. Uh, this premise, in my view, uh, is not quite right with respect to the United States, but I will not say much about that. It is wholly inadequate with respect to Europe, which never had anything akin to a coherent uh, immigration system at any point in a time. So the main problem in Europe today uh, really is um, um, how to transfer and rebalance uh, uh, jurisdiction between national and supranational levels. And I don't think for that there's anything akin uh, to that in, in the United States. Uh, NAFTA, as you know, explicitly excluded uh, uh, labor from its uh, reach. So this is very much a European story, whatever the story is I will be telling you. But back to the uh, point, there cannot be a coherent immigration system. The quest for that is um, a chimera um, in whatever place. Uh, there cannot be a coherent immigration a policy, a patchwork between um, or a patchwork with divided legal regimes and friction between those uh, cannot be but permanent. Uh, why is that? Um, for many reasons. Um, the main reason is because of highly variegated uh, uh, migration realities, uh, uh, realities uh, with highly dis disparate power interest constellations and with highly disparate and disjunct uh, accompanying political logics. Just to give you flavor, example number one is uh, look at the distinction between low versus high-skilled uh, immigration. In high-skilled immigration, demand <coughs> exceeds supply. In low-skilled immigration, it is the opposite. Supply and even vastly exceeds uh, so, uh, demand. So this makes for <coughs> rather opposite political logics. Uh, I would call one logic the logic of stemming <coughs> to keep away a kind of a control logic. And I would uh, call the other uh, logic one of soliciting, of uh, laying out red carpets, uh, that is a logic in which you actually have to compete with uh, other countries because migrants have uh, better skies, say, than the low skies of uh, Britain to go to. Here a completely different mindset and, and regulatory framework is required uh, than uh, that with respect to keeping out unwanted family migrants or asylum seekers, as is the problematic in, in Europe today. So there can never be one policy of immigration, only policies in the plural with differing, even opposite legal infrastructures and political logics. A second example, and with that I probably exceeded all of my time, uh, <laughs> look at the distinction uh, that drives you, of course, uh, a lot, uh, legal versus illegal immigration. Uh, 
The Europeans are more interested in the high versus low skilled stuff. You are more in this legal versus illegal distinction. But the Europeans have an interesting experience uh, with that. One justification at EU level for a legal immigration policy um, and kind of American style was to uh, ward off illegal immigration pressure from the South. That has been the justification proffered by the European Commission in its various uh, recommendations over the past 15 years. Um, and that is a totally naive assumption that once you have a legal policy, then you will not have illegal people. It's totally against the elementary kind of uh, sociology 101 of, one of uh, migration that uh, once uh, legal uh, uh, acceptance and legal policies c help create networks, then these networks will be acted on and they uh, develop a kind of self-reproducing uh, quality where then no policy intervention of what uh, of whatever kind can can have an impact on that's that's the whole story of uh, that Douglas Massey is uh, telling if he's speaking to policy uh, circles. So um, yeah, uh, so also here then it's very obvious you can never here have a co coherent policy where everything uh, every every part of the kaleidoscope is uh, fully in line and everything is in intended and is all fully designed. Uh, that is an example uh, of uh, the impossibility of that. Now the European. System. Having questioned the possibility of a coherent immigration system, what is the European one? What aspects of it uh, are of uh, interest to you, both positive and negative? I will focus on regionalized uh, competences here and policies. I presume that is where your interest is, not to hear what England is doing or France, but what the EU as a supranational institute is doing. And I will follow the usual distinction in that between integration and control as very uh, distinct uh, policy uh, domains here. With respect to immigrant integration, this domain remains largely under uh, national control, uh, uh, except uh, especially nationality laws where there is zero uh, import by uh, Brussels. The only supranationalized competence is in anti-discrimination uh, policy. And that, that since 2000 you have an anti-race, uh, a, a so-called race directive that uh, goes after um, um, uh, discriminatory practices in, in a large set of domains. Uh, uh, that is uh, such a progressive policy that even recognizes uh, indirect uh, discrimination in a large variety of sectors. But it stops short of affirmative action. In Europe you call that positive discrimination and here the US is always uh, uh, used as a, as, a, as, a, as a negative contrast case. That is what we do not want to have. Overall in integration uh, a policy, the European reality is increasingly uh, inclusive citizenship. That's one facet with some recent setbacks on naturalization, uh, but not a rollback of overall liberalized uh, nationality policies. Uh, and moderately aggressive uh, anti-discrimination uh, under this supranational uh, uh, track, uh, along with the celebration of diversity, which is a code word for the multiculturalism that remi remains uh, despite its nominal kind of by word retreat. And this part of the European system, um, of the European integration system, looks very American, if you want, very inclusive. Uh, diversity is a pop word, even slogan. Uh, uh, Sarkozy wanted to write it into the French Constitution. He didn't uh, succeed with that, but uh, he is uh, very uh, American-sounding in that uh, in that uh, respect. There's one difference in, on the integration side uh, where uh, Europe uh, it makes it uh, uh, sets a different accent, and that is with respect to so-called civic integration policies for newcomers, which here have largely, uh, particularly in the Netherlands, repressive connotations, uh, and whose indirect purpose is to restrict unwanted family uh, migration. And I say that only in brackets here. Um, this fusion here of integration and control agendas is largely unknown in the US where family migration has, remind, has remained surprisingly uncontested. It would be really interesting to compare and contrast the different uh, uh, debates surrounding family immigration in Europe and in the US, or rather the absence of a debate of the, uh, uh, on that in, in the US and the high prominence of family migration in, in, in Europe. But let me stop uh, uh, here with respect to uh, integration. Immigration control 
um, which is really the major focus, despite the panel this morning, I presume, in this notion of a broken system. Um, here, the making of a European uh, immigration policy has been on the agenda since the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997, and significant advances have been made in this uh, direction of supranationalizing immigration control. <laughs> Um, what drives this supranationalization of controls that Europe is really now at the brink of having a coordinated uh, euro level immigration policy? It helps undercut very liberal rules at domestic level. Liberal rules that are good for immigrants with respect to family rights, with respect to uh, residence uh, rights, uh, etc. And these are liberal rules that at domestic level are protected by very aggressive, especially constitutional courts. There is no plenary power in Europe that makes life for migrants in that respect, in legal respect, a bit easier, I think, than in, in America. Um, so. Uh, member states wish to supranationalize uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these areas in which they know they cannot win the game at home with respect to increasing restricted, uh, restric restrictiveness, so they use Brussels as a, as a kind of uh, a side uh, tour or as a, uh, the, the career of the long-term residence directive uh, of the family unification directives, two important supranational rules here, is exactly to be understood in these uh, terms. However, member states' control desires, which are meant to be realized through the Brussels route, notoriously underestimate the rights, the rights focused interventionism by the European Court of Justice that then mobilize certain progressive aspects uh, of European law, most importantly free movement rights in favor of uh, immigrants. That is already very visible if you follow the legal details. By now, under supranational competence, in terms of these European Council directives, are almost all aspects of immigration policy, except labor migration. Examples being distribution of short-term visa, asylum determination, long-term resident status, family reunification, entry and residence of students and researchers. All of that is supranationalized. In addition, there have been a host of call it operational measures at EU level, sophisticated information and identification systems, SIS, VIS, Eurodac, whatever, and I will not, uh, I don't even know what these acronyms stand for, except that they are very uh, nasty things in terms of uh, collecting uh, information. Uh, and what you have is a multinational border control, so-called Frontex, which is not a preservative, but it's, uh, um, it's Europe's multinational border control. Uh, it does not not really replace, but it complements in advisory fu function national border guards. So what is the last bastion of still nationalized control with respect to immigration? It is economic migration. Um, and uh, in my logic, what you can easily explain why this is the last bastion of still nationalized control, um, um, because de decisions over economic migration are always discretionary, discretionary at the, uh, from the point of view of the receiving state. There is no need here to undercut two generous rights on the part of immigrants through the Brussels route. The one council directive that has so far uh, been issued on economic economic migration is on high-skilled uh, immigration, the so-called Blue Card Directive, which actually uh, uh, came in law just in May uh, of this year. Blue Card obviously is modeled on the Green Card. However, the Blue Card uh, will not make the Green Card fear and tremble. There are certain deficiencies of that, uh, of that uh, uh, deficient version of the real thing. It is only temporary for a maximum of four years, though it is renewable. National discretion has been left fully in place, so the European scheme does not really overrule existing or still to be created national schemes of high-skilled migration. European countries then can recruit labor migrants according to the European or according to the national uh, framework. <laughs> Bizarre coexistence here. National sovereignty is left 
left in place even with respect to nominally free movement of high-skilled immigrants after an initial 18-month period. That is kind of the core of the directive. But even here, a second member state can always say no if a high-skilled migrant wishes to move after 18 months from the member state of first acceptance. And this does destroy the one competitive advantage of Europe. You know, when the blue card was to be announced, there was this major selling point. Ah, we can really compete with America if uh, we have an admissions uh, system which gives the migrant access to uh, 27 labor markets simultaneously. And then you can just, in winter, you can go to Palermo and uh, in, uh, <laughs> you know, in the summer you go for a cool shower to Bergen, Norway, say. Uh, Norway wouldn't work that. Well, that would work because it's part of the enlarged European, uh, European space. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, exactly that purpose has unfortunately not been realized. So the blue card is a funny, funny um, first foray into the last bastion of still nationalized migration control, which is, which is with respect to economic migration. And I conclude, what can the U.S. now uh, learn positively and, and negatively? Positively, that was a point that uh, Alainikov mentioned already yesterday, um, <laughs> negatively speaking about the U.S. here, courts with their individual rights agenda are really central to the European immigration system. There is nothing akin to plenary power here. Um, and if any uh, immigration system has to balance uh, on the one side the interest of migrants with the interest of uh, the various actors and sectors of the receiving society, then immigrant interests are in principle better protected in Europe than in the U.S., but only with respect to legal integration. Uh, this is immediately kind of counterbalanced by political disadvantages that migrants face in, 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 uh, in, in, in Europe because uh, there is nothing akin to the absorptive uh, political system and party system uh, uh, that you have in the United States uh, that, that could uh, be of advantage to, to migrants. So with respect to uh, the legal framework is quite progressive in many respects with respect to the intervention possibilities of courts, but the political framework, political incorporation is, is rather weak and weakly developed and no much changes in the opposite direction are on the horizon. Negatively speaking, um, the European, kind of the negative uh, uh, lesson to draw, the European immigration system is indeed still premised on the exceptional and temporary only nature of uh, migration. It is still a guest worker systems of sorts. Um, the logic is one of gradual status uh, confirmation or consolidation over time. There is no routine trajectory from legal permanent resident uh, status at entry to citizenship at the end. I say that only in brackets here. The only country where legal permanent residency is available at entry American style, if you want, or Canadian style, is curiously Germany, but that only within a very uh, restrictive uh, policy that accepts uh, a handful of high-skilled immigrants uh, per year. So Europe is still and will remain a continent uh, in which immigration is uh, kind of extraneous to the system and exceptional and not central to nation building. But I heard something interesting that uh, was against my prejudices uh, today. I heard that uh, even in the US there is a shift from the green card uh, route of entry towards you start with a temporary permit and then you may earn your way to the green card and then that may even be um, in sync uh, with increasingly circular migration uh, and no longer this old 19th century idea of Albert Einstein idea you move terminally from place A uh, to B. Yeah, that's true. I, I had always kind of defended the Americans here and thought that's a really good idea to have a, a, a permanent ticket to entry up over from the start, as it were. And I have always thought the Europeans with their mediocre gradualism, you know, uh, uh, they have something to learn from America. But turn it around, it's true that uh, perhaps the Europeans are interestingly in the avant-garde here with respect, <laughs> to, with respect to a new phenomenology of migration, which indeed is, uh, is circular. And maybe this is not such an unintelligent framing of increasingly circular immigration. And I think I overstepped my time largely. I was always uh, expecting 
expecting some sanctioning here. It didn't come. Made me ever more nervous, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs> We now we'll have uh, Elena Letona, Executive Director of the Centro Presente in Boston, co-founder and Associate Director of the National Alliance of Latin American and Caribbean Communities, and an Executive Committee member of the Salvadoran American National Network. She's a native of El Salvador with over 20 years of work in the nonprofit arena. After earning an undergraduate degree at the Oberlin Conservatory in Piano and History of Music, she received a PhD in Public Policy from the University of Massachusetts. Let's welcome Elena. Here's the million dollar question. Can you see me? Okay. Thank you, Miriam. And I just want to um, state for the record that actually I'm no longer at Centro Presente, and I recently joined the National Alliance of Latin American and Caribbean Communities. Uh, and I'd like to start by saluting you because you're still here <laughs> and awake. So thank you, and uh, thank you, Sonia, for inviting NAILAC to be part of this conference, and in doing so, inviting the perspective of the Latino and Caribbean immigrant community uh, into this conversation, a perspective that I think is quite important, not only because we are a significant portion of the foreign-born here in the United States, but also because we suffer disproportionately from the brokenness, or maybe not so broken because it's always been broken, nature of our immigration system. Um, so I, I'd like to start by saying that um, we have been calling for comprehensive immigration reform for a number of years now, and some would argue that we've been calling for comprehensive immigration reform since at least 1996, when IRA-IRA was enacted. And IRA-IRA was perhaps the last time that any real comprehensive uh, change to immigration law was enacted. And IRA-IRA, as you all know, uh, firmly established a, a framework a, that is very punitive and very restrictive, and that is the framework under which we are currently living. Now, in the year 2007, after the famous grand bargain uh, legislative proposal or the Kennedy-McCain proposal fell through, many of us felt that it was necessary and urgent that we start being more specific about what we meant by comprehensive. Because what we saw in 2007 really scared us. And so uh, NALAC has, uh, in its framing of the message, we have been trying to get more specific about what we mean when we say immigration reform. And we have uh, spoken about humane, sensible, and visionary. So I am going to turn uh, to discuss one um, each, you know, in a turn. Uh, and here I'd like to first say that it has been very... Um, uh, gratifying uh, to have heard all the prior speakers because I will be echoing a lot of the uh, ideas uh, that have been posed in the prior panels and that suggests to me the emergence of themes that hopefully will be integrated into a new legislative framework. And so I probably won't be saying too much new. I will be echoing many of those thoughts and hopefully complementing with some other um, ideas. So first, humane. To us, that has almost everything to do with the framing of immigrants right now. And by that, I mean as illegal, as illegal aliens. And worse yet, as illegal criminal aliens. Now, if you ask yourselves, if that is our starting point, if that is the view that we have of immigrants, clearly is not surprising that we are ending with very punitive and very restrictive policies. And the prior panel, one of the speakers said, words are everything, and so we can't talk about amnesty, we can't talk about braceros, and we cannot talk about commissions, I believe he said, the ABCs. Well, we need to start saying we cannot talk about the illegals, because that is getting in the way 
of humane, sensible immigration uh, policy. Now, I, I really want to spend some time questioning the framing of illegal. And, and I, I feel like I have to because that has become so normalized. That has become just so much a part of a rhetoric that I cannot tell you how disappointing it was to hear President Obama reassure Americans that no a reform to healthcare system will not uh, include illegal immigrants. I mean, it has just become the normal way that we think about and we talk about immigrants. And so the reason why I think it's important to question that frame is because supposedly we are illegal immigrants because we broke the law. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but I do believe that there are many, many ways of breaking the law. I do believe that it is behaviors that, like stealing that are illegal or things like marijuana that are illegal. But we don't call people that run a red light illegal, and we don't call people that launder money illegal, and we don't call anybody that break the law in any shape or form illegals. We only call people that overstay a visa and that cross the border without inspection illegal. So it, it, we need to be very aware of what happens to our psyches when we use these kinds of words. And I would love to have more time to go into what words mean and you know how they create reality, but there is unfortunately not enough time. So in my opinion, when it comes to rethinking immigration policy, we need to start there. Because at the heart of our current immigration uh, legislative framework is that view of immigrants. And if they are illegal, and if they are aliens, and if they are criminal, well, clearly, we are going to punish them. The other thing I want to say about the term, uh, about the framing of illegal and legal is that in reality is, is kind of like a false dichotomy, in reality. Because in our communities, we are multi-status families. And so, for example, one of the uh, arguments that I heard uh, being used in favor of the DREAM Act of, or uh, policies like in-state tuition is don't punish the children for the sins of their parents. Okay, so deport the parents but keep the kids? I mean, you know, the, the whole illegal thing, again, is uh, uh, presenting a huge uh, and, and very problematic barrier to our moving forward, you know, with visionary uh, immigration reform. Um, the last thing I'm going to say about this subject is that, in the end, illegal alien is a total abstraction. And, and I love the, the picture in uh, David Bacon's uh, slideshow. You know, there was a woman carrying a banner that said, I'm not an alien, I'm from this earth. <laughs> I, I just love that. I was born on this earth. But what I mean about an abstraction is that while we are reacting and enacting policy you know, for illegal immigrants, we are okay with these people picking our fruit, you know, cleaning our bathrooms, taking care of our children, our elderly, et cetera, et cetera. And we are not connecting with the reality that that which we are rejecting and fearing and othering are actually the people <clears throat> that we are relying on for very important um, services. And very briefly, I want to share with you an anecdote that happened to me a couple of years ago when I was still at Centro Presente. And I was here in Washington, D.C. as part of um, you know, advocacy work that we were doing. And uh, it, it, I think it was around the time of the Kennedy McCain bill, as a matter of fact. And so we were visiting um, Senator Kennedy's office. And, and of course, you know, you, you get the same, you know, reaction that what you what you want to see is not it's not politically feasible that you know, what you want is not you know it, it's too idealistic etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so anyway so as you know in the congress you know to to go from the senate offices to the uh, office uh, house of representatives offices you have to cross the capitol right so we started walking from the senate offices you know towards the other end 
And as we did that, it was around one o'clock in the afternoon. They were, you know, cons doing construction. And from, you know, just underneath the ground and the earth, there came all these workers for the lunch break in the hard hats, in their lunch boxes. And I looked at them and said, they're my people. I wonder how many of them have just a temporary worker status, you know, card, what we call TPS. I wonder how many of them are working with false papers, and here they are, you know, working in the construction in the middle of the capital. So we are not connecting the reality with what we are doing, and I think it's because of this abstraction of the illegal alien. Now, in the point number two, sensible. For, for us, this, um, this has everything to do with the layering upon layering of failed policies. I mean, we have spent uh, a day and a half now uh, going very deep into what's broken about immigration system, why it is broken, what makes it broken, et cetera, et cetera. And what doesn't make sense to us is why do we continue proposing the same old same old. If these policies have not been effective in stemming migration flows, if these policies have not been effective in uh, responding to the labor market needs, if these policies have not been effective in protecting the rights of millions of people, why are we continuing to propose the same old, same old? And I say this because Senator Schumer's seven principles are nothing new. They are a continuation of IRA, IRA, if we look deep, deeper. The so-called grand bargain of 2007 was nothing new. So that to us is not logical. It's not sensible. So. In terms of rethinking immigration policy, we need to truly grapple with that reality, take a very critical look, ask very critical questions as to why do we have these policies, what do they accomplish, what is the cost benefit of having these policies and continuing these policies, and if it is way too idealistic to wish for the abolishment or the most egregious aspects of the 1996 law, then at the very least, let us not add more layers to an already problematic and broken system. Now finally, in terms of visionary, here we are talking about the necessity of understanding immigration within the broader context of US foreign and international trade policy. And uh, the panel prior to this one went into um, depth about the global economy and how that is um, promoting migration flows. You know, we, I, I don't need to belabor the point, but you know, what's happening in the United States is clearly not happening only here. It's happening all over the world. And we know that the kinds of uh, neoliberal policies that have been implemented here in the United States since at least the 1970s, as Ruth you know, pointed out yesterday, the same kind of policies have been implemented in most of the world, and that the effects for the global south have been devastating. And I think, again, the slideshow that David showed was very uh, visually um, indicative of what those effects are. And again, I don't need to belabor the point. And the only thing I'd like to add here is that because the world is indeed way more integrated, not just economically, but in other ways as well, people in the global south, in countries like El Salvador and Mexico, migrate not only because they are hungry and because they need jobs, because you see that has been pretty much the history in Latin America, right? I mean, it's a fairly poor part of the world. But it is also because our minds, our vision has been expanded because of globalization. We are exposed to different ways of different possibilities, different ways of being we can dream. And the North 
specifically the United States, has a tremendous pull on us because of that history between the United States and Latin America, primarily Mexico. So there's already a family member here. Um, there are jobs here. So the pool is incredibly, incredibly strong. And what we have been saying at NALAC for a long, long time is that we need to take a look at how the United States is relating to Mexico and the rest of Latin America in terms of economic integration policies. NAFTA is not the answer, and I think David did a very good job in explaining to us why. We need to, again, connect with the reality of how much more integrated we are. And Gary this morning talked about has some fear that the United States is becoming more Latin, you know, the Latiniz Latinization of the United States. Well, if you travel <laughs> to other parts of Latin America, you would see that Latin America is becoming more American too. I mean, the kinds of foods we're eating, the kinds of music we're listening to, the kinds of movies we're watching. So the cultural integration uh, is already underway. And uh, our hope is that while I really liked um, Jennifer Gordon's proposal of the transnational um, labor visa, uh, our hope is that in the long term, we're going to move even farther than that into a, a more integrated model, maybe along the lines of the European um, Union. That would be really nice because we think that the future is in that kind of regional integration. So let me um, uh, close by telling you what you already know, and that is that clearly we don't come to the United States to take advantage of the system, even though that's why they say about us, because it is anathema, really, to our dreams of, you know, and our way of being, of actually working very hard to make a life for ourselves and our families. And besides, the system will not allow us to take, you know, to take advantage of the system anyway. So it is a total myth that we live off welfare, for example. The law itself does not allow it, even for legal permanent residents, to access many government benefits, let alone those among us who are undocumented. But the ethos in our community, by and large, would preclude our taking advantage of the system. We take pride in our hard work. We take pride on making it in the United States and making our dreams come true. And in the process, we are very well aware that we benefit this country as well. In a series of community meetings that we held, NALAC, in various cities throughout the United States this past summer, we confirmed that our notion of who we are stands sharply against that of what is propagated in mainstream media and even the halls of Congress. We know our worth. We know that by and large, we hold jobs that are essential, yet in the lower rungs of the service se sector, where our labor is exploited. We know that we pay taxes and that we get very little, if anything, in return. Yet, we maintain our faith in the promise that this country indeed will one day recognize that all men and women, regardless of you know, immigration status, are created equal and endowed with unalienable rights. And we hope that when it comes to reforming immigration law, it will be with the view of ourselves as people, as human beings, fully deserving of that treatment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard T. Fulton, Director of National and Legislative Affairs in the American Jewish Committee's Office of Government and International Affairs in Washington, D.C. He coordinates AJC's domestic policy activities as well as overseeing legislative advocacy on a range of concerns, including religious liberty, civil rights, immigration, energy security, and foreign affairs. He was a member of the National Immigration Forum and testified on immigration issues before the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He was also a litigator with a New York law firm. He received his BA in political science from New York University and his law degree from Harvard Law School. Let's welcome Richard Fulton. Thank you. Uh, it, it's really a great pleasure and honor to be here and to participate 
in this conversation, uh, which has now, with the last two speakers, begun with a reflection on the title of this session. Uh, and it, it happens that I tweeted uh, that I was going to be on a panel uh, called Rethinking Immigration Policy and received a response from one of my friends. I mean, somebody has thought about it already in the past. Uh, and one thing is for sure, in the last day and a half, there's a lot of people thinking about it and thinking about it very seriously. And uh, I'm pleased not. Why is immigration reform, why is immigration policy a Jewish issue? Uh, we all understand Israel security, uh, separation of church and state, uh, you know, other issues that seem much more core issues. Why, why immigration policy? And I, I think the best answer to that, to that question is, is that uh, the position of my organization has taken is that it's a fair and generous uh, topic of immigration reform. Uh, it's important not only for our nation's definition, but also for the Jewish tradition, which teaches us that stranger is required to be here, and so it's important that we have a compassion for the quote-unquote stranger among us as well. Further, we recall how our parents and grandparents made their way to this country seeking a better life, often fleeing persecution, and know that we have prospered because of all that this country has offered us. And that same opportunity should be available for others as well, and indeed, our country should do better than it has sometimes done, as in those sad days when the gates of this nation were closed to Jews fleeing the conflagration that destroyed all but a remnant of European Jewry. So while the Jewish community today cons constitutes only a small portion of the immigration flow, we see immigration reform as in the best interests of our country overall, as well as assuring that our country acts in accord with its highest values. Now. <clears throat> Now, as we talk about comprehensive immigration reform, uh, there, are, there are some basic parts of it that the Congress has been wrestling with for a number of years, and as has been said about a certain international conflict, we sort of know what the solution will look like. We just have to figure out how to, how to get there. And in this case, uh, what, what Congress has been considering for a while has been legalization, uh, dealing with future flows, many argue family unification has to be part of this structure, and as well, uh, issues of border security and enforcement. And I will focus my remarks today on those couple of last key aspects of the urgent need for the reform of our immigration system uh, to, to be effective in keeping out those who wish to do us harm and, and to discuss how that can be done in a fashion consistent with due process and humane treatment, but understanding that even as we have seen that the enforcement only approach has been an utter failure and cannot be the way in which we deal with immigration reform. So also, as we think about immigration reform, I'm, I'm focusing on these issues, but in the understanding that they have to be part of a bigger picture of, of immigration reform. In short, our nation has a right and obligation to safeguard its borders, as well as to make and enforce its sovereign determinations as to who shall be allowed to immigrate to this country and who shall not. This is separate from the question of what the substance of those determinations is going to be. And about that, we've heard, we've heard some you know, very thoughtful remarks over these day and a half, this day and a half, and that's a, that's a conversation that has to be had. But it's a separate conversation from, since you know, Professor Alenikoff, notwithstanding, we're not quite yet at the end of the nation state, uh, we, we need to think about what we as a nation have to do to safeguard our own security at the same time as we move towards a better and more humane immigration policy. And at the same time, of course, we have to push back against the unfortunate tendency in some quarters to equate immigrants undocumented and otherwise and asylum seekers with terrorists. This should and must be rejected. The great preponderance of those seeking to immigrate to this country do so to seek better lives for themselves and sometimes because they've been singled out for persecution at home. Whether or not they will ultimately be allowed to enter and remain in the United States and even whether they seek entry in accord with our laws, we remain obligated to treat these people with dignity, to provide due process to the extent it is, as it were, due, and ensure humane treatment. Now, why did I just use that phrase, due process, as it were, due? Because I do think we have to make a distinction between human rights and separately, to some extent, international law, as opposed to the constitutional law and the extent to which it provides protection for people who are seeking entry into the United States. And there is, I think, uh, some, some, some good question as to how exactly, in what, in what way and, and to what extent the Constitution applies to people who are not yet present in the United States. But it is not, again, to say that there are not standards of international law and even of human rights that have to be applied to how we're going to deal with, with those people. Uh, 
Having said all of this, the challenge of border control and enforcement are only made more difficult by the existence of a sea of undocumented immigrants in which those who seek to do us harm potentially can swim, not to mention uh, the potential of their entry due to failures of our entry processes. And were there not already good and sufficient reasons, and there are, for moving towards a path to normalization and rationalization of future flows that are core aspects of comprehensive immigration reform, the need to address those national security concerns would provide a sound basis for moving in that direction. Uh, in addition, I should say also, as a person that deals with Congress, I think we also have to look at the political reality of the fact that even if we didn't think that, that security issues were, were intertwined with what our immigration policy is going to be, certainly members of Congress think that. And if, if we think we're going to get some kind of reform that doesn't deal in a serious way with issues of security, of border control, and, and enforcement, uh, if we think that that's, we're going to get some kind of comprehensive immigration reform that deals with those issues without, without dealing with, with those two specific issues, we're fooling ourselves. It's just not, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, it's, it's been a challenge for, for us as part of a coalition that sometimes working in coalition with our partners who are part of the cause fighting for comprehensive immigration reform, that issues of security and enforcement are sometimes treated in effect as, as dirty words, that we have coalitional statements in which we struggle to even have the need to protect security through comprehensive immigration reform referenced because they, they have seen the security imperative used sometimes as an excuse for dehumanizing and, 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 and failing to provide dignity to those who, have, who, are, who are seeking to have entered that country. So we have a, a, a difficult road to walk sometimes in trying at the one time, at the one hand, to enforce the need for dignified treatment of individuals for assuring uh, that there's humane treatment, and at the other hand, on the other hand, to assure that these security concerns are addressed. So turning to broader policies, uh, these must be consistent with humanitarian values and with the need to treat all individuals with respect while allowing the United States to implement its immigration laws and identify and prevent the entry of criminals or persons who wish to do us harm or otherwise pose a risk to our national security. In updating border security measures, there should be greater intelligence sharing regarding potential terrorists among the nation's intelligence and gatekeeper agencies, increased use of the state-of-the-art anti-fraud technology to create counterfeit-resistant passports and visas and analyze suspect documents, layers of security with multiple screening points for those departing and arriving the United, at the United States, and improvements in the system that track foreign nationals who enter and leave the U.S., including much more vigorous monitoring, or more vigorous monitoring anyway, of those who enter with student visa, visitor or employment visas, uh, and, and other aspects of that as well. On the internal enforcement front, as Congress considers, as part of comprehensive immigration reform, the creation of a mandatory electronic work eligibility verification system and action on employer sanctions that penalize employers for the knowing employment of unauthorized immigrants, the verification system must be more accurate than the systems now, now in place. We know that, the, that reliance on the current systems has really poten grave potential for denying work to people who are perfectly eligible, eligible to work and should incorporate adequate safeguards to protect workers from the discrimination that has far too often accompanied efforts by employers and officials ostensibly directed toward assuring that only those eligible to work are employed in the workplace. What form will this take? Will it take the form of, a, of an improved and expanded e-verify system? Will, the, will it take the form, form of some biometric identifier? I don't pretend to have the answer to that as I, as I stand here today, but that is, as, as things are moving, it seems very likely that, that is going to be part of a comprehensive system. <clears throat> Similarly, while it is, it is doubtful that we will ever see a complete end to resort to raids and detentions, to the extent these are used as a means of immigration enforcement, they should be narrowly tailored, they should respect human rights, they should be effectuated in a fashion consistent with due process for all persons. Uh, the administration uh, just recently announced a change in its, in its practices affecting detainees. Uh, as often happens in these cases, it, it's been attacked politically from, from both sides of the spectrum, uh, but they have moved, they're moving towards now towards a system of announced policy changes to have a system of separating detainees who are accused of serious crimes from asylum seekers and those who are accused only of entering the country. Uh, I use the word illegally, advisedly, uh, creating alternatives to detention uh, and providing adequate health care for detainees and creating a more effective system of oversight for detention facilities. Indiscriminate immigration enforcement raids in homes and workplaces have caused needless trauma and hardship for thousands of individuals, separating families, destroying communities, and threatening the basic rights of immigrants and U.S. citizens alike. Similarly, the suffering caused by the 287G program 
which has led to widespread misuse of local law enforcement in civil immigration matters and racial profiling and done huge harm to the principle of local policing underscores the problems with current U.S. immigration policies and the urgent need for reform. So the administration and Congress should therefore reduce the use of detention as an immigration enforcement mechanism, especially with respect to vulnerable groups and those seeking asylum, and improve detention conditions by enacting clear enforceable reforms that include rigorous medical treatment standards, increased access to pastoral care, legal counsel, and legal orientation programs. Furthermore, the government should expedite the release of asylum seekers and others who pose no risk to the community and expand the use of community-based alternatives to detention, which are more humane and cost-effective. In sum, it is time to enact legislation that includes the following, an opp the opportunity for hardworking immigrants who are already contributing to this country to come out of the shadows, to regularize their status upon satisfaction of reasonable criteria, and over time pursue an option to become lawful permanent residents and eventually U.S. citizens. It's time to reform our family-based immigration system to significantly reduce waiting times for separated families who currently wait many years to be reunited create legal avenues for workers and their families who wish to migrate to the U.S. to enter our country in a work in a safe, legal, and orderly manner, and border protection and enforcement policies that are consistent with humanitarian values <clears throat> and with the need to treat all individuals with respect while allowing the authorities to carry out the critical task of identifying and preventing entry of terrorists and dangerous criminals as well as implement our immigration laws. The sum of these measures will bolster our national security even as it better moves our nation toward a more humane and, and rational immigration policy. And I'll close by saying that even as we must be mindful of the intersection between immigration and security policy, we should not make the mistake of, of imagining that they are identical. And it is critical also that our elected officials and all of us conduct the immigration reform debate in a civil and respectful manner, mindful not to blame immigrants for our social and economic ills or for the atrocities committed by the few who have carried out or would want to carry out acts of terrorism. A polarized process lacking in civility hinders the liberative discourse and fails to serve our nation's best interests. Mm. And finally, Rasel Salazar Pareñas, Professor of American Civilization and Sociology at Brown University with a PhD in Ethnic Studies from UC Berkeley. She's the author of Servants of Globalization, Women, Migration, and Domestic Work, and Children of Global Migration, Transnational Families, and Gendered Woes. Her latest book, The Force of Domesticity, considers how processes of globalization simultaneously reinforce and challenge traditional gender norms. She is currently writing bo a book on the labor and migration of Filipina hostesses in Tokyo's nightlife industry. Welcome, Russell. Um, so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I feel like Sonia is my new academic buddy. We were just in, Cop we were in Odense, Denmark, a couple of weeks ago. We're here again today, and then we're going to be somewhere in Europe again next year, right? So yeah. Um, so what I'm going to say actually mirrors a lot of what Richard Fulton just said. And um, I feel like the conference is going to come full circle, because I'm going to make the same argument that Ming I did, and she was the first speaker in this workshop uh, conference. And um, she was emphasizing how migration is not family driven, but it's labor driven. And she was calling attention to the problems of the, of the preference category set up in the 1965 immigration law. And then that was revisited again in the 1990 immigration law. So I'm going to do the same thing. Um, I also want to show what I want to also show is how, um, and this is also in direct response to the young man from UC Berkeley earlier. Um, that I think it's really important for us to always look at the family and labor as intertwined as we revisit immigration policies and uh, things agreeing with me. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to, uh, because um, our conditions of labor must always ensure our human rights and our right to a family life is a central human right that we have, that we should make sure that all of our workers have. And um, a third point I want to make um, is um, in the last, the, since yesterday, we've focused a lot on legalization and that we think um, there's kind of underlying assumption that if we get legalized, then that's the answer to everything. Um, but I want to show, um, what I want to point out is that legalization is not the answer because oftentimes the conditions of legalization are quite inhumane. And um, I 
I think it's my phone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'm doing that so then I don't go over time. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, like I was saying, um, I think we have to be careful in um, just advocating for the legalization of immigrants because oftentimes um, authorized migrants, migrants who are legally here, not just as guest workers, but as legal permanent residents, um, face their own set of exclusion. And so um, I wanna give you, as an ethnographer, I'm gonna give you three examples of when that happens. Um, and so to do that, what I really wanna do is, um, I make these points by um, revisiting then the, this idea, like I said, that family reunification is the cornerstone of US immigration policies. And the US did that in 1965 to make itself look like this humanitarian country. And so from the surface, we do look quite humanitarian because we give um, immediate family, re we give immediate family reunification to immediate family members, right? So parents um, and children less than 21 years old of um, uh, citizens of this country can come in and that's not the case in Europe. And then um, the latest UN Human Development Report said that about 70% of migrants that come into the US are indeed family-based migrants. Um, but what I wanna show is sometimes the law actually forcibly separates migrants from their families, and so I wanna give you some examples of when that happens. So um, that actually occurs um, in the case of domestic workers that get legalized. So most domestic workers in this country remain undocumented, but those who are, quote, fortunate enough to get sponsored by the employer face this experience of what you can actually say is indentured servitude. Um, so in this country, there's this program called the Labor Certification Program. And under this program, like um, the Department of Labor lists uh, jobs every month, and if your job is listed there, you can sponsor a particular migrant worker for legal permanent residency and domestic work as one of those jobs. So if an um, uh, employer sponsors you as a domestic worker, um, the time that you get sponsored to the time that you get your green card, um, you are what is called an out-of-status migrant. Um, and as an out-of-status migrant, during this time, um, your family can't follow you yet because technically your visa application could still be denied, right? So the question is how long does it take on average for a domestic worker who's been sponsored by em her employer to get her green card at from the moment that that application is processed? So according to Demayan, which is a non, it's a nonprofit organization that's affiliated with Domestic Worker United in New York, it takes an average of 10 years for this person to get her green card. So what is her conditions of um, labor and migration during those 10 years. So first, she's actually coming in as a labor migrant, but then she's not a laborer, because technically in the US, a domestic worker is not a laborer. So then she's not protected by the Fa Fair Labor Standards Act, which basically entitles her to overtime pay. Um, so you can just imagine her, she's probably underpaid, she's overworked, and then to top it all off, she doesn't get to see her family. So technically, she can go back to the country where she came from, but then she really risks not being able to come back here. Um, and then, so then, like I said, she can't um, also, so her kids and her spouse can't follow her during this whole time. So you see 10 years of forcible separation. And so um, in my study of children left behind in the Philippines by their migrant parents, I met many children of domestic workers in this situation. And um, what's amazing is that, um, let's say, a mother sponsors her child. Um, well, what if she's over 21 years old by the time her mother gets her green card? So then she doesn't qualify for immediate family reunification anymore. Because of the 1990 law, um, legal permanent residents can actually get immediate family reunification, right? Um, however, there's actually like not immediate family, but if they're over 21, they're still a waiting, list, a waiting period, and so that's six years. So then it's like 10 plus six, so it's like 16 years really that the kid has to wait to reunite with her mother. So the point is that is US law. And if the mother quits because her job is so bad in the 10 years that she's waiting for her green card, then she risks obviously not getting legalized in this country. So um, the point I wanna make is, um, let me see what time it is. <laughs> the point I wanna make is, um, is really important then that um, we shouldn't just advocate for legalization, right? and that we have to look at the conditions of legalization. So that's one example. Um, so I wanna give another example, um, and this is not drawing from my own ethnography, this is drawing from Hung Tai's 
a uh, very good book um, called For Better or For Worse, which is on um, low-wage Vietnamese laborers in this country um, who marry highly educated uh, Vietnamese women in Vietnam. And he calls these two groups the marriage of the unmarriageable. So Nasli Kibria in her book you know, had established that the m gender ratio in the Vietnamese community is skewed, where there's a lot more men than women. And then, you know, Hung Tai then um, shows how these men are often not marriageable, and they're not desirable because they're, they're low earning. So the women don't want to marry them. So then they want to, so they want to get married. So then they have to go to Vietnam to find a bride. Um, so so he, I'm kind of disappointed he footnoted this. But then he has this like story about this guy who like eats top ramen all the time. And he eats all this top ramen because then he saves all his money so he can send it back to his bride in Vietnam. And then he visits his bride for like three months and then he comes back here so they have this transnational marriage. But then why is this you know, occurring? Well, he says you know, there's convertibility, meaning the money of the low-wage laborer can um, buy a lot more in Vietnam and can sustain a middle-class lifestyle. But if you actually look at the footnote of his book, one other reason that this occurs is that that man does not sometimes qualify to sponsor his bride because since 1996, to sponsor a foreigner into this country, you have to earn at least 125% the poverty line. So then you can see then this like low wage Vietnamese migrant worker struggling and working very hard, let's say as a dishwasher, that was like his sample, the, the guy he was looking at in the United States, but then he is denied the ability to have a family life because he's too poor. So that's one other scenario. Of course, I mean, there's ways to go around that. You can get a richer relative to sponsor your wife, your bride. But um, in his case, the longest that, in his study, the longest that a, a couple was separated was seven years until the husband was able to earn enough money for his wife to join him. And then the last, do I have time to give a last example? Yeah. And then the last example I want to give um, is, um, it was mentioned already, um, which is the mixed status families. And so you have these families in which there's an undocumented parent and then the family, and then his children or her children are um, U.S. citizens uh, born in the United States. Um, so prior to 1996, um, these families were, you know, protected uh, with these, you know, principles of human rights that the family is uh, have the right to be together. And um, if a family can prove that the deportation of the undocumented parent will cause extreme hardship to them, then they can, um, the judge can enforce what's called a cancellation of removal. And so since 1996 that human right has been denied these mixed status families. Mm -hmm. And that the law particularly says then that, um, so I'm going to quote it here, that it says that um, showing that an alien's United States citizen child would fare less well in the alien's country of nationality than in the United States does not establish exceptional or extremely unusual hardship and thus would not support a grant of relief under this provision, unquote. So before you could say that if I get deported, my kid would face hardship. Now that's like they don't really want the undocumented person to get immigration benefits through their US citizen child, right? So then um, what happens then when they get deported, then they have to stay outside of the country for at least three to 10 years before they can get reunited again. So I just wanted to give these three examples um, to show how um, human, human rights are often denied um, legal residents of this country. And that um, this notion, like May was saying, that migration laws are family driven, I think my examples show that they're clearly false. It's a very selective process of what kind of families that um, the United States is allowing. And um, I think, um, so I think you know, we should um, emphasize that you know, family reunification being the cornerstone of, U cornerstone of U.S. immigration policy, we should establish that it's a myth. Um, I do think that it is um, not necessary for us to say, oh, we should have family-driven migration policy. I think it's okay to be realistic to have a labor-driven migration policy like it is right now. But I think if it is, um, we should not forget um, that we also need to have um, humanitarianism as much of a priority as our labor needs. Mm. Any questions? Let me play devil's advocate with you for a moment, Rishon. Um, 
Oh, let me play devil's advocate with you for a moment. Um, there is a an expansion of what we conceive of as human rights that obviously is not incorporated into the creation of national rights by the state, by the sovereign state that people are in. So in your Vietnamese example, right, if he's married before they come here, then the entire family joins the visa holder. Uh, so it is, in a sense, the choice of the U.S. legislature to encourage people to marry in this country, right, and not to bring country girls, uh, country guys, here by marrying them afterwards. Now, today we might consider that a violation of some kind of human right to marry as one wishes, but is it therefore um, a, 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 an obligation on states to facilitate the entry into that country of someone without treating them as a new applicant. Okay, so it's partly about the relation, the question is ultimately about the relationship between an evolving conception of human rights and state or government uh, prerogatives. Uh, your, um, your nanny who is sponsored and waits for a long time is, as we learned in the first discussion, uh, in that kind of boat because she's from one of the four countries that is heavily backlogged. Now that is a question that ought to be addressed head on, but she could be from 120 other countries and have immediate access for uh, her uh, family. So um, that's, that's the kind of pseudo unfriendly question for you. Do you want me to answer yeah, that? Here and together, okay. Any other questions? Cindy Hamovich. Uh, let me just start with a, a story. I did an interview through a translator with a Mexican man in North Carolina, 2003, so after 9-11. And he, as he said, people kept calling, uh, calling him an Arab and a terrorist and so forth, and he's uh, mistaking him for something he wasn't. And, his, and he said, um, what can I blow up on $5 an hour? Um, but uh, <laughs> I wondered, in listening to uh, Richard and, uh, and also to Elena, what, whether I'm right to think that um, the immigration climate has changed dramatically since 9-11, and in fact, the... Um, uh, you're just thinking of, of the uh, earlier discussion at lunch of uh, the visit by Vincente Fox when he was president-elect with Bush when he was president-elect and, and Vincente Fox called for an open border and, and there was just sort of nervous laughter from the press but there, the sky didn't fall, there was no hysteria and then we have 9-11 a few days later and then rather than, than seeing images of you know, terrorists sneaking into the country because we, we don't have any of those, we see images of Mexicans coming over the border. And it really seemed like the Minuteman and his nativist forces took such advantage of people's reasonable insecurity by shifting our gaze in the direction that they wanted us to look, which was the, uh, the border, when one thing had nothing to do with the other. Um, so that's my only concern about the security issue is that it's, um, uh, it's connecting issues that in some ways are very separate and, and really need to be separated. Gary. Uh, this is for uh, Christian. Um, uh, it, would, it's, it, it would help me a lot, uh, not just me, but those of us who are interested in immigration in the U.S., uh, to find out as much as we can about other systems in the world that exist. Uh, Europe's being one of them. And so I find, found your comments really interesting, and I wanted to ask you for um, uh, to elaborate on a, on a couple points. Uh, one is you mentioned very briefly that uh, family integration and reunification is not an important principle of immigration policy in Europe. And if I heard you correctly, and I, I, and I want you to elaborate on that, um, in the interests uh, I, I, of May's initial challenge to us 
to rethink the distribution of quotas, uh, should we also open up discussion in this country, not just of the distribution of quotas to different countries, but we haven't really opened up the question of the hierarchy of preferences in this country in terms of what we prefer and the place of family and skill and other things within that. And so I'd be very interested in, in, in the European case in that regard. Secondly, um, in regard to, to bring Dal Myers into this, I want to uh, throw the European fertility crisis at you. And it seems, Dal, Europe is ripe for your kind of demographic analysis. Uh, and uh, it seems that parts of Europe face a very extreme fertility crisis and uh, no possibility of continuing the welfare state without heavy infusion of immigrants. And I wanted to, you to address that. And, and finally, in relationship to that, which grows directly out of it, I noticed the last line of your biography, what you're working on now, which I don't think you mentioned in your talk, which is Islam <laughs> in Europe and North America. So uh, the second issue ties directly to the third, which is the numbers of immigrants to Europe who are likely to be Muslim, how Europe is dealing with this, and how you see the European example of that integration, non-integration, versus the case of the United States. So. Are you planning to have it here for the whole evening? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay, so we're so. Um, I'm just going to answer um, briefly. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't write your questions down. But first, um, the quota, uh, the the preference system has nothing to do with uh, uh, why a domestic worker is an indentured worker for 10 years. It, on average, it takes 10 years for a domestic worker to get her green card, regardless of what country she's from. And that number has actually increased since Shelley Colin did her study in 1992 on Caribbean domestic workers in New York. So this figure that I gave you from Damayan was like actually in the mid-2000s. So you see then that it takes much longer now than it did in the early 90s for a domestic worker to get her green card. Um, and so during that time, she's forcibly separated from her family. And so if she is from the UK, well, no, that's not a good example, but if she's from the Maldives, let's say, <laughs> um, she can see her kids probably 10 years and one day later. If you're from the Philippines, then it's like 10 years plus six. So that's what we're talking about, right? And then the question of the Vietnamese uh, migrant, um, I, I just want to actually clarify that um, there are from here, like they are working here, they came here, let's say, as infants, and they decided to marry a Vietnamese woman. And so I, so I don't know what you were talking about that they met in, you know, that they were in Vietnam together and they came here. So you also have to look at this group as like a refugee group, right? And as a refugee group, I think they have different status than other migrants. No, now you've lost me. I mean, that's <laughs> what we said. we're going to talk about. So I'm just talking about an average American. If you're not rich enough, then you can't marry a foreigner. That's what. I, that's the only thing I'm saying. Regardless, I mean, they can be from Vietnam. They can be from the South. They can be from anywhere. But should that, <laughs> but the question is, should that upset us because we subscribe to a human, some kind of newly emerging human rights norm that says you should be able to pick your spouse from anywhere and have them if you are not a citizen of the country, in this case the U.S. But they're citizens of the U.S. If you're a citizen of the U.S., you're saying that what follows? That if any citizen, if I you have cannot parents, sponsor if, if you're poor. poor. If you're poor. poor. In other words, a poor person, a poor citizen of either gender, any gender, cannot have a foreign I'm country. a U.S. citizen. I make $17,000 a year. Right. I cannot marry someone in the Philippines and bring him over here. Yes, or I might not have a family, like, I, you know, yeah, I might not. Okay, yeah. Right, okay. That's yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, just to respond, I, I, I want to just say something about that question, although I don't have quite all the, 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 I don't have this hypothetical quite clear, but except just to make the point that not everything is either an issue of human rights or you're not entitled. I mean, there are policy decisions to be made, and the Congress... Uh, can make decisions, even if you don't believe that there's a human rights or an international law imperative that says this ought to happen, we could decide that as a matter of policy, we think it's a good idea for spouses to be able to 
to be with their spouses. I mean, that, that, that's a policy decision. Uh, I, I want to come, but, but more to the point, the question was directed to me. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I hear that concern sometimes you know, expressed. W let's not talk about the security issue because you know, people, somebody's going to misuse it. I mean, 9-11 did make a difference in terms of attitudes towards immigrants. I think we're moving in a better direction. You know, you had these bad laws that were enacted in 96. They began to be rolled back. I, one began, some of us began to detect different changes in attitudes towards immigrants, and then 9-11 happens with all kinds of ripple effects, some of which is the very unfortunate conflation of immigrants and, and asylum, even more remarkably, people fleeing persecution with, with dangers in terms of terrorism. Uh, so that there's that danger. On the other hand, if, if to try to deal with that, we want to pretend it's not a dangerous world out there. Remember, you know, Hill Street Blues, you know, it's... Hey, it's dangerous out there. It is dangerous out there. There are people that do want to come to this country that would want to do all of us great harm. And so we have to have systems that the one pla at the one time try to deal with that as reasonably and as unhistorical a fashion as we possibly can and, and put in place and at the same time not make this a closed society in terms of who gets to come here. And we, we can't deal with that if we don't accept the fact that there, is, there are dangers and threats that we have to address. And more than that, even if we think we can, you know, we, we don't want to address them, the folks that are making our laws are certainly aware of those dangers, and God forbid, you know, that they're not they're not tough enough, and then something awful happens, and you're only going to see an, an acceleration of that effect. So we have to we have to be realistic about what what the nature is of of those that mean to do us harm, and as best as we can, without stereotyping and without you know casting aspersions on those who are not responsible for it, build a system that both both protects us and enables us to be as open a society as we can in what is still a dangerous world. Uh, very briefly to the question, yes, absolutely, 9-11 made things worse, but I would also argue that um, things were not necessarily headed in the right direction, even when Fox and Bush were talking to each other, and the reasons are the following. Let us not forget Prop 187. Let us not forget 1996. And, and, and one question that has not been addressed so directly throughout the conference is race and the United States' uneasy relationship with new immigrants and now the fact that we are, by and large, um, immigrants of color. So, and the last thing I would mention here is that I believe, and I'm not the only one that believes this, that the issue of immigrants right now, the illegality, you know, the Mexicans, the Latinos, whatever, it is very much a part of the extreme right wing agenda. I mean, strategy, and and we we and, and we say that because when we look at what happened over the summer around the debate on uh, healthcare reform, you know, illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants. So what I'm trying to say is that the huge demographic shifts that have been happening since the 1990s, um, the extreme right wing is using all of that to tap into latent racism, xenophobia, you know, blah, 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 in the United States and, and, and using, you know, this issue of uh, immigrants, you know, to push forth their own agenda. So. I, I, my sense is that even if 9-11 had not happened, somehow or another, you know, it would have come up and it would have continued, you know, what prop when 87 started in the 1990s. Uh, my plane goes at 10 o'clock, so I have a lot of time, <laughs> all the time in the oh world no. to talk. Huh? <laughs> Um, family unification is a big matter in Europe. It's one of the major uh, migration issues in Europe today, but uh, family uh, migration is fundamentally differently processed and considered uh, in, in Europe. Um, here in America, um, and one should really say the United States, family migration is the way in which you process um, wanted legal permanent immigration. It was your decision in 1965 uh, to do that. 
Um, and by the way, it was not really sold as uh, human, well, maybe that was a bit of rhetoric uh, that it's humanitarian, but one has to know that it was at the time a quid pro quo for, uh, you know, uh, it was about ending racially uh, discriminatory this national origin system, and then the conservatives didn't want that. They were afraid of the racial change that would come with it, and so the, uh, the peace of grace which they uh, received uh, for giving into it is uh, family unification because the assumption was that would minimize the racial transformation that would go along with the racially neutral immigration policy. Um, um, so it's legally, it, it's wanted, uh, uh, it, it's the way in which you process uh, legal immigration that is essentially wanted. In Europe, family unification is uh, essentially unwanted immigration uh, it's as of right immigration that states, the political branches of the state would rather prefer not to have, but courts insist their fam family rights of already existing immigrants and domestic constitutions and the Strasbourg Convention say there's the sanctity of family life and you cannot uh, step uh, on that. And, and the big issue now, and Sarkozy was the one to brilliantly bring that to the point, is to shift from uh, suffered to chosen immigration. Suffered immigration is uh, immigration you don't want to have, but you have to accept for legal constitutional reasons. That is asylum and, and family, and the wanted one is the high uh, skilled type. Uh, family unification is also totally differently processed in, in, uh, in, in Europe because it's connected to the uh, problem of apparently failing uh, uh, Muslim uh, integration because family unification is very often between Turks, uh, Turkish and uh, Moroccan resident uh, uh, or already naturalized Dutch or German citizens who get brides in their country of origin who don't speak the language of the place and then that reinforces the seclusion and the uh, the uh, separation of, of these larger ethnic communities. So it's a fusion of migration control with integration considerations that makes uh, family migration a very uh, 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 difficult and particularly European uh, problem. And of course you should rethink your categories here in this country. For what reason should you select uh, your legal newcomers uh, through the quota system, 75% say through the family route? What, what is what is the wisdom of the fifth preference? Uh, Alainikov was still rather polite about that yesterday. Um, there is no such. Uh, America is totally alone in the world in doing it. And it was totally a random, conservative, backward looking, uh, retrogressive uh, motivation at the time. And why should it now be dipped in, in all these shining, progressive? I mean, wh why not? Well, th that is, to me, a puzzling uh, American uh, exceptionalism. Fertility crisis in. In, in, in Europe, indeed, uh, if you see the numbers in Europe, uh, 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 Dowell will know that much better. They are even much more worrisome. You know, you, already Italy these days is a theme park. Uh, so whole, <laughs> yeah, whole villages in Tuscany are owned by foreigners <laughs> or bought in, in a lump uh, some back and then refurbished for American investors and Japanese investors, uh, no, this is dramatic. It's dramatic indeed. Um, the problem, ho uh, however, is uh, no politician, no vote-seeking politician can speak that language. The only political body in the EU that uh, brings that uh, notion of fertility crisis and immigration is a good response to it is the one non-democratically accountable body, and that is the EU. It's a European Commission that usually spikes its, uh, its proposals with the reference to the fertility crisis. In Europe, the, the, the iron uh, constraint of thinking about immigration is the numbers have to stay small. Therefore, the substitution game in Sarkozy's uh, uh, realm, from suffered to chosen. Uh, when America had the debate in 1990 about legal immigration, the, the general solution was you increase the pie so nobody will be trampled on. No one's interest will be... The ethnics, uh, they shouted, of course, when family fifth preference was to be cut in order to enlarge uh, the economic uh, intake, and uh, that was not possible because of their, uh, port, uh, their no, political um, yeah, presence here. Uh, so the pie was just increased so that all in the end were... That logic is not possible in Europe because of... Uh, 
uh, naja, the presence uh, of right-wing populist movements and parties in, in most countries. And that's a big, uh, I mean, Sarkozy was very progressive in many ways. He, the first thing he did after winning the presidency is creating a ministry for national identity. That is the immigration ministry. And that killed Le Pen. That killed Le Pen. Yeah? So th that is a condition that is much more uh, difficult for p vote seeking uh, politicians in Europe than in. So nobody can talk the fertility talk even though the societies need it, absolutely. The logic of representative democracy is against it. Islam in Europe, uh, and I still have three hours' time here. Um, um, <laughs> in, in my view, uh, those people get it wrong who think um, Islam is an issue in Europe because uh, European states are, in principle, uh, incapable of um, accommodating Islam in equitable, just terms. I don't think that is the case at all. There is very decent, uh, very uh, uh, impressive institutional accommodation. I mean, the veil story is, of course, the complete uh, uh, the media are all about it, but it's the exception to the rule, as it were. Yeah? Um, it's not a problem of uh, how religion is processed. In Europe, it's a problem more or less of the demography of, of the mis Islamic, first the numbers, the numbers. Huh? Five million, uh, one doesn't know the real numbers in France, but it's an estimated five, three between six million, probably five million. In Germany, it's uh, six million. Uh, so the numbers are very, very high. Uh, the average immigrant in Europe is, is an Islamic immigrant. And uh, na ja, that makes, for, for m m I mean, the, it's more visible as a phenomenon. Um, and to this comes a second uh, kind of demographic, sociological consideration. The average Islam immigrant to Europe is, is an, a, a kind of an ex-postcolonial immigrant. I mean, the offspring of uh, the second and third generation. They have postcolonial origins. And that's a very poor, low-skilled uh, immigrant intake. The average uh, American uh, Muslim immigrant is a Rolex-wearing Mercedes-Benz driver in Beverly Hills. I could see them in the early 1990s, or I could guess it was an Iran. They're very wealthy, and they were fleeing a regime uh, that did too much of religion, though they have no instinct to have veils and all that stuff uh, to be uh, imported into, into America. Uh, uh, so a lot with uh, Islam is the universally available idiom in which the experience of disadvantage and of discrimination can be articulated. Globally, it's, it's a globally available idiom because of globally politicized uh, Islam. And you have, you have the problem of the failure of second and third generation uh, uh, immigration, which is much more dramatic in Europe than anything you would have with Mexicans in this country. I, I don't know the precise situation about Mexicans, but it cannot be in any way comparable uh, with the very, very dramatic failure uh, of uh, second and third generation Islamic immigrants. In, and they hear the tune of, uh, of globally uh, 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 distributed Islam, and, and that, speaks, that speaks to them. You don't uh, have the resonance for that tune among the much better are doing uh, much, they go to school in America, they have jobs in America, um, I I Islamic uh, ethnic groups in, in this country. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, Otto Santana from UCLA. Um, in this panel, I want to discuss the uh, impact and effect of uh, the immigrants immigrant rights movement in the last few years and its, uh, its um, potential for adding complexity to the uh, debate and possible legislation. Would anyone want to comment? No, oh, I, I would love to, just because, you know, we've been, does something very dear to, to our heart and the, the work that we do. And when it comes to rethinking immigration policy, one of the things that I did not get the chance to say because of time is that we also need to rethink the way that we are funding the work. Uh, as we know, there is, um, you know, there, there, there's a desire that is accompanied by a lot of money, philanthropic dollars, to get immigration reform enacted. But the way that the funding strategy 
uh, much as the legislative strategy has absolutely no connection to the grassroots, and I think that it's that we're missing a great opportunity to take advantage of this moment uh, to begin planting the seeds, or maybe not even planting the seeds, but nurturing those seeds that were planted in the year 2006 with those marches to continue fostering the kind of civic engagement and the kind of um, a immigrant incorporation, you know, politically speaking, that the panel, the opening panel in, uh, this morning uh, spoke about. So I, I would conclude, you know, my answer to you by saying that um, we come from countries in Latin America with very rich histories and traditions in organizing. Uh, I think that Latin America right now is presenting a very exciting alternative uh, to what we have in the United States, you know, politically and economically speaking, so that as a people, I think we have um, great things to contribute, you know, to the continued, you know, evolution uh, of American politics and that it would be very um, beneficial both to the United States and to immigrant communities um, as we move forward in rethinking immigration policy as to how we can take advantage of this moment to continue nurturing you know, that, that, that exciting moment that we saw in the year 2006 as a way of uh, fomenting civic engagement in what will be eventually the new Americans. So, can, um, okay, I, I, oh. very briefly. Okay, okay. very, very briefly. Oh. Uh, I, I just wanted to perhaps differ, just touch, and this relates back to a comment we heard in an earlier panel about how immigration reform should not move forward by looking to what business interests are as well as those of, of immigrants. And my job is counting votes. And, you know, maybe in terms of where, in what immigration policy will look like 10 or 20 years ago, that's, that those are great observations. But, in terms of there are people that are hurting right now because we don't have comprehensive immigration reform and we have to think about what's doable in terms of even in terms of taking into account interests that some of us may may not preferably want to do so and i think that has to be part of how we think about moving forward in, in strategizing and what we actually do to move towards immigration reform well i think those two are two very very good notes to end on um i want to thank everybody once again for coming i want to thank this panel and all of our panelists uh, I also want to really thank our staff here at the Wilson Center. A lot, you're not probably aware of all the <laughs> incredible work they have been doing uh, behind the scenes, uh, pulling together at the last minute, especially our AV people. Um, you may not have realized, but practically everybody in the AV department this morning was taking pictures except for the three-month-old son of the actual official photographer. But otherwise, everybody was in here with a camera to make sure we had pictures of all this, which will be, which will be up on our website at uh, some point. Um, thank you so much to my co-organizers for thinking about this, for coming up with such wonderful suggestions for panelists. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing from us in the future some, some, some version of this, some uh, either website or some kind of publication, or hopefully more meetings will come out of this, and we'll keep you informed of that. Um, and thanks again to our sponsors. Um, the Carnegie Foundation, Vanderbilt, Columbia, and New York University of Southern California, and the Mexico Institute of the Wilson Center. Thank you all for your generous support um, and safe travels, um, and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.